Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be doing some good proper med ed content. Today is all about high yield ECGs in preparation for high stakes junior level exams, whether that means something like finals, the UK MLA, PLAB, the common barn door ECGs that you need to be able to reliably recognize, not obviously just to pass your exams, but when you are working on the ward. To be clear about what this video isn't, it is not a video on how to read ECGs or understanding the broad physiology of how ECGs work. This is purely quick fire focused basic summary of the physiology associated with each ECG and the associated findings. So to start with, common and sometimes curable. Atrial fibrillation occurs due to lots of different foci, in turn leading to an absence of coordinated atrial contraction. The atria are basically doing what they want. That chaotic electrical activity happening in the atria then results in a very inconsistent transmission of those signals through the conduction system through to the ventricles. But really specifically, it's through the atrioventricular node. Because of that, the ventricular response to that signal then becomes irregular, and the atrial depolarizations are not then coordinated with regular ventricular activity, which is why we get an irregular rhythm. On an ECG, that classically results in an irregularly irregular rhythm without distinct P waves. The next one to talk about is atrial flutter, and this is different because it's caused by a re-entrant circuit that typically develops around the annulus, that is the ring associated with the tricuspid valve. So you have this signal going round and round and round. This leads to a rapid and regular, very fast atrial contraction at around 250-300 beats per minute. Since the atrioventricular node can't actually conduct all of these signals that are being fired through it, only some end up transmitted through to the ventricles, which leads to a characteristic conduction ratio, usually something like 2 to 1 or 4 to 1. That is to say that we would expect the ventricular rate to be half or a quarter that of the atrial rate because of what's effectively a conduction block. So on the ECG, we see characteristic sawtooth flutter waves, or F waves they're sometimes called, with a regular ventricular rate, and we would usually expect to see a 2 to 1 or 4 to 1 pattern of atrial contractions to ventricular contractions. Number three, supraventricular tachycardia. It's a rapid tachycardia that originates above the ventricles, supraventricular, which typically involves a re-entrant circuit just like atrial flutter, but this time it's around the atrioventricular node, or some other ectopic atrial focus. These impulses are conducted down a normal his Purkinje system, which leads to a narrow QRS complex and a regular ventricular contraction. Because that rate is so fast, the ventricles have less time to fill up, which then decreases our cardiac output and leads to the classic symptoms like dizziness, palpitations, or even syncope. So on our ECG, we would expect to see a narrow complex tachycardia with a regular ventricular contraction. Now it's time to talk about the heart blocks. In a first degree heart block, the delay in conduction occurs at the atrium ventricular node. This can happen for a number of reasons, including increased vagal tone, some medications, things like beta blockers, or some other underlying cardiac disease. Crucially, the impulse is still reaching the ventricles, as we would expect, but it's taking longer. Conduction is impaired. And we see this as a prolonged PR interval on the ECG. But the conduction system is intact, so despite that delay, every single impulse is still conducted properly, which means there are no missed beats. So on the ECG, we see a prolonged PR interval with no dropped beats, which tells us that there is a delayed but eventual conduction from the atria to the ventricles. So moving on a second degree heart block, a Mobitz type 1 or a Wenke back, is a progressive fatiguing or slowing down of that conduction through the atrioventricular node. What that means is that each successive beat takes longer and longer to process through that node, until one eventually gets blocked, leading to a dropped QRS complex. That means we have a predictable and repeating cycle of PR prolongation until a beat is missed completely, and there is a cycle of increasing delay until conduction fails completely and the cycle begins again. As the old rhyme tells us, going, 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 gone, 
that's Mobitz type 1. A Mobitz type 2 block is different because the conduction problem is happening lower down in the conduction system. This is a sudden intermittent failure of conduction below the atrioventricular node within the his purkinje system. And unlike a Mobitz type 1, in this case the PR interval remains constant because the problem is not delayed conduction. This is an unpredictable failure of conduction, it's intermittent which makes it more dangerous because it can lead to a sudden drop in heart rate and progression potentially to complete heart block. So on our ECG, instead we see a constant PR interval that remains the same every time, but with completely unpredictable dropped QRS complexes. So what we have is an all or nothing failure of conduction. If some beats don't get through, that's Mobitz type 2. And then finally, in complete heart block, or third degree heart block, there is a total absence of conduction between the atria and the ventricles, leading them to function independently of one another. The atria will be contracting at one rate and the ventricles contracting at their own rate using their inbuilt pacemaking systems. The atria will still be relying on the sinoatrial node to coordinate their rate, but the ventricles will be using some sort of escape rhythm as we call them, which tends to come from the AV node or somewhere below it, so we see it much slower rate of contraction in the ventricles compared to the atria. So on the ECG we see complete dissociation between the atrial rates and the ventricular rates your R waves will not match your P waves. There will be a complete lack of correlation between P waves and QRS complexes. So to complete our rhyme, if P's and Q's do not agree, that's third degree. So now we'll move on to the arrest rhythms, the ones that you'll probably know in the context of ALS if you've done it. Let's start with ventricular tachycardia, VT. This originates from an ectopic focus or some other reentrant circuit within the ventricular myocardium itself, which leads to a rapid, abnormal deep polarization of the ventricles. Since the normal conduction pathway through the Hispokinji system is being bypassed, the QRS complexes are broad, completely abnormal in appearance, and crucially this rhythm can compromise cardiac output, as we have both a rapid rate and an inefficient form of contraction, meaning that overall our circulation will be reduced. So on our ECG we will normally expect to see a broad complex tachycardia. Next we'll move on to VF, which is just completely chaotic ventricular activity, much like we see in AF, leading to uncoordinated, rapid, ineffective contractions. This disorganized electrical activity basically results in the heart being unable to pump blood properly at all, causing more or less immediate circulatory collapse. Our ECG shows us a highly irregular waveform showing no discernible P waves or QRS complexes, or even T waves, which indicates a complete absence of any coordinated ventricular activity. And then lastly for our arrest rhythms we'll talk about PEA, pulseless electrical activity, because you don't need me to tell you what asystole looks like. What this specifically means is that there is electrical activity visible on the ECG, but this is not coordinated with a palpable pulse which means that despite that electrical activity being there, the heart is not contracting effectively enough to give us a palpable pulse, hence pulseless electrical activity. This could be due to a number of different things, including hypoxia, hypovolemia, acidosis, some other mechanical or physiological reason stopping the heart from contracting properly. So crucially, the ECG may appear to be organized, but on examination, there is no palpable pulse, indicating a failure of circulation so you'll need to combine this ECG with some more information. Now on to some electrolyte disturbance. Let's start with hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia, as the name tells us, is associated with very high levels of potassium in the blood. If you think back to the cardiac cycle, what that's going to do is disrupt the cell's resting potential and make them more excitable. And as that potassium level goes up and up, the ECG will go through some characteristic changes, which looks like it's essentially being pulled. The three features I would recommend remembering are the classic tall tented T waves, which is down to faster repolarization, flattened P waves, and widened QRS complexes as that conduction slows down. In the most severe cases, it leads to a more sinusoidal looking pattern and potentially complete asystole, which means that in severe hyperkalemia, you need to be able to recognize it and get treatment done quickly. Otherwise, you could be looking at fatal arrhythmia. Then the second one that comes up often is hypocalcemia, low levels of calcium in the blood, 
think back to the cardiac cycle. If you have less calcium, your cardiac myocytes are less able to contract and it will take longer. So that's going to prolong the depolarization phase of the action potential. On the ECG, that will extend the ST segment and in turn increase the QT interval, or a so-called long QT. And if you get a question stem, you may also see something about muscle cramps or tetany, which reflects the widespread effects on muscle contraction throughout the body. It's not just limited to the heart. We're onto the home stretch now, the occlusions. Let's start with everyone's favorite, the STEMI, an ST elevation myocardial infarction. STEMI is ultimately caused by a complete and sustained occlusion of a coronary artery, which leads to one, myocardial ischemia, and two, transmural injury. Because the ischemia here is gonna extend all the way through the myocardial wall, we see an elevated ST segment in the sections that correspond to the territory supplied by that coronary artery. This is a critical marker of ongoing myocardial damage, and to prevent irreversible damage, the patient needs reperfusion therapy of some kind whether that's PCI or giving clot-busting drugs. So on our ECG, we would expect to see ST elevation in the segments corresponding to the territory supplied by the affected coronary artery. And then lastly for this video, the NSTEMI, or non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Unlike its big brother, the STEMI, which is complete occlusion of a vessel, NSTEMI is down to partial occlusion of a coronary artery. That leads to a so-called subendocardial ischemia that affects only part of the myocardial wall, not the complete wall thickness. That partial ischemia, instead of elevating the ST segment, results in T-wave inversion or depression of the ST segment. Without intervention, this ischemia can still lead to myocardial necrosis and scarring, but it may not produce the classic ST elevation that we would expect from a full-blown STEMI. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that's been helpful for you. Those are some ECGs that you must know for finals, the MLA, and other high-stakes medical exams. I hope you've enjoyed the video and found it useful. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. And I'm keen to make useful med ed content for you guys, things that are gonna be a bit more evergreen, like the chest x-ray videos that have done really well and people keep coming back for. I wanna make it a bit more focused and useful. We're gonna be looking at other imaging modalities. We'll do a bit more ECG, physiology, Eindhoven's triangle and that stuff, but let me know what you want to see. Taking it a bit further, would you like to see some A-level human biology type content? There's lots we could do do some pharmacology. I'm a big believer in getting the basic sciences absolutely nailed down in preparation for proper clinical practice, so let me know what's useful. Take care, bye-bye.